Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 112, He Who Defends Everything, Defends Nothing. As we covered in episode 109, Churchill broke the cardinal rule concerning the concentration of forces. His forces had been concentrated in North Africa, and he had been winning. They were concentrated in East Africa, and the Commonwealth forces there had all but won. Yet now there were too many forces in East Africa, which is overkill. Another rule was being broken. And at the moment, there were not enough forces in North Africa, which Rommel was currently exploiting. Also, there weren't enough forces on Crete, and certainly not enough in Greece and the Germans were about to exploit those weak points as well. Backing up this military failure was a political one. British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden won a night-long meeting with the Greeks by getting them to agree to his version of how Greece should be defended. Unfortunately for all concerned, he was off on the number of men being sent to Greece and had, in fact, misled the Greek ministers with his idea that Turkey would undoubtedly step in too once they saw how bravely the Allied forces were fighting. What's more, not that Eden was saying this, it was his intention to have the British-led forces in-country just long enough to bring Turkey into the war, because once they were committed, well they were committed, and would fight as if their lives and freedom depended upon it. But his brilliant plan, or rather brilliant manipulation, falls apart when one considers that Turkey had no intention of making real the foreign secretary's hopes. This diplomatic fantasy, combined with fewer Commonwealth forces than promised, completed the failure of what was about to come. The question that comes to the fore is, why did Churchill and London push for this, this desperate defense of Greece? Wavell didn't want it, couldn't see how it would work, but didn't see the decision as his, and carried out his orders. Still, many of his brother officers would be angered that he didn't fight harder against his prime minister. The answer is that London and those in power carried psychological baggage. The failed appeasement of Chamberlain still lingered in the air. The Czech state had been let down, Poland also, massively so. Greece could not be added to that list, even if the British did not have the men or the means to alter what was coming. Also, Germany's move against Greece was taken at face value by the British. Was this the first step to conquering the Balkans? to overrun Turkey, take Iraq, and seize the Suez Canal from the north, the African push of Rommel being only a feint? No, Hitler's strategy was much more limited. He was going to Greece to shore up Mussolini, to get there before Stalin did, and most importantly, to shore up his southern flank vis-a-vis -vis his impending invasion of the USSR. And in doing so, was equally guilty of scattering his forces before the main battle. Meanwhile, the worthy Greeks were making their own mistakes. The British wanted them to pull back their most forward lines in Albania and Macedonia, and to fall back to the Alekmon line, just north of the city Larissa. But this the Greeks could not and would not do. They could not because of the Italian albeit short-lived, offensive, that Mussolini had personally supervised in early March. No, the enemy had to be watched constantly for any fresh offensive, even if it was ill-advised. They would not, because the land they stood on now was paid for with Greek blood. But in those victories, the Greek army had used itself up mightily, and most of its ammunition. That was the Greeks in relation to the Italians. When it came to the Germans, it was a different matter. Negotiations between the two were still ongoing. Greece was treading that fine line between the Axis partners. 
The Greek government made it clear they had no problem with Germany, only with the invading Italians. To demonstrate this, even though the Greeks had asked the British for nine divisions, when W Force started showing up, led by General Maitland Jumbo Wilson, and with him were only two divisions, an armor brigade and some tanks and artillery, with promises of more, the Greeks demanded that Wilson arrive dressed as a civilian, under the name Mr. Watt. So, as the Greek people cheered the arrival of the Commonwealth forces, their government officials and ranking military remonstrated. In the end, there would arrive on the Greek mainland just over 53,000 British and Commonwealth forces, which mattered little, because the Greeks' logistics were in shambles. Deployment was only the beginning of a certain kind of hell for the newly arrived troops. And unbeknownst to General Wilson, the staff in the Middle East had already begun working on evacuation plans. Beyond this, the Germans knew all about the landings. Well, most of it. Because, one, as Greece had not yet broken diplomatic relations with their soon-to-be occupiers, as Allied forces landed at Piraeus to the south, there was a German military attaché recording each unit. The second reason, and this is my favorite, is that also in the area was a German officer with, I'm guessing, a decent British accent, dressed as a civilian, talking to the British officers about his fox hunting exploits. They, in turn, assumed he was from home and gladly answered all his questions. Yes, Field Marshal von List, the man in charge of all German troops going against Greece, had the particulars of the Commonwealth forces. Around 80% of the BEF going to Greece was made up of Aussies and New Zealanders, and here, too, Churchill did not shine. The Prime Minister told Eden to tell those country's leaders that Operation Luster, the code name for sending troops to Greece, was a decision made by their military leaders, that the men in uniform believed defending Greece was doable. Luster was not the fulfillment of a political promise that could not be supported by reality, no. Churchill finished his note to Eden with, Grave imperial issues are raised by committing New Zealand and Australian troops. And he was right. Which is why Australian Commander Lieutenant General Blamey or New Zealand Commander Major General Freiburg were not brought into the talks before their troops were en route. If there was a wild card that may actually help the Allies, it was Yugoslavia. If that country could just tie up the Germans for a time, or trip up their headlong rush south, then that many more Commonwealth forces could be offloaded to Greece. The reality, though, was, for the moment, not the number of men being landed, but the number of ships to get them to Greece, and then the number of vehicles to get those men into defensive positions. But that wild card seemed to disappear on March 25th, when Prince Paul's government signed a pact of loyalty to the Axis. Yet, there is always hope, especially if one desires to see what, in fact, is not there. The agreement said nothing of Yugoslavia helping to invade Greece, or that German troops could use the country's rail lines. But there was a clause, innocent enough sounding, that said Germany could send by rail war materials and medical supplies by sealed train. But of course, there would be much more inside those trains than ammunition or medicine. Which brought on the protests throughout parts of Yugoslavia mentioned in episode 109. Four cabinet ministers quit, the people took to the streets, and within 48 hours, King Peter, not Prince Paul, sat on the throne with Air Force Chief of Staff General Simovic at the head of the new government. Yes, Yugoslavia was defying the Fuhrer's master plan, which enraged Hitler, as we discussed. And sensing this, the new government promised to keep its pledge concerning the treaty. After all, they were not required to fight anyone. But Churchill only made it worse when he praised 
the defiant country. Yugoslavia had found her soul. Hitler now found a reason to crush the country under his heel. Now events fell into place. On April 3rd, Russia signed a non-aggression pact with Yugoslavia. This was all that Stalin was willing to do at the time to hopefully keep Nazi Germany out of Yugoslavia, something he wanted for Russia. And Churchill, thinking he had Stalin this close to challenging Germany, told the British ambassador in Russia to share Germany's intentions, gleaned from Ultra, of attacking the Soviet Union in the near future. Sadly, only after Germany moved into Greece did the Prime Minister find out that Stalin had not been given the information. I'm sure 10 Downing Street shook from the invectives erupting from the bulldog. For what it's worth, I don't believe, given the shock Stalin suffers when the Nazis do come, that he would have trusted any reports from the British. So, there were the Greeks, victorious over the Italians, but exhausted for it. Now they found themselves in dire discussions with the Germans. It was their last and only hope for staving off a war they could not win. But there would be no peace. Hitler had already decided on that. Hopefully, the British were as good as their word. Thus, the stage is set. Now our actors come into view. On Palm Sunday, April 6, 1941, the German minister in Athens met with Prime Minister Alexandros Koretsitz to inform him that war now existed between their two countries. The hows and the whys didn't matter all that much, because German forces had been attacking Greece and Yugoslavia since 5.45 a.m. What the German minister didn't say was that Germany was using 32 divisions for these campaigns, and they didn't expect the war to take very long. Yugoslavia immediately declared Belgrade, their capital and the largest city of Serbia, an open city, hoping the Germans would not treat it like Warsaw. General Deal of the British Imperial General Staff and Greek General Papagos had met with the Yugoslav Chief of Staff, General Yankovic, and saw firsthand how unprepared the country's forces were to combat the Germans. Most bitter of all, the Yugoslavs had refused to align their main defensive positions in the south with the Greeks to the west in Albania and the British to the right along the Alakmon line. The Yugoslavs, like the Greeks, were hoping their inaction would lead to German inaction. It was not to be. The Yugoslav one million man army had not been positioned at enough key places to defend its access points. Open city or no, Hitler wanted the country and its people to suffer, and those within the capital did. Officially, Berlin replied that there were simply too many vital military targets throughout Belgrade. It could not be ignored. In reality, it was probably all those British and French flags fluttering in the breeze throughout the capital that Hitler meant, as the people there made their affections known. Operation Retribution commenced with the Luftwaffe sending 150 well-protected dive bombers against the capital alone. Hospitals, schools, churches, and places of Belgrade pride disappeared underneath a flash and then rising clouds of debris. After what air protection there was over the capital was knocked out, the Luftwaffe used a combination of explosives and incendiary bombs to start leveling the city, section by section. After that, German aircraft then flew even lower, just over the rooftops, to machine gun the fleeing populace. At least 12,000, but probably closer to 17,000, civilians died that day, in the capital alone. Besides many lives being cut short, the capital's communications were also severed. Any organized resistance on a national level was impossible. The remaining government officials ran south to Uzitse, all the while under the howl of the German dive bombers. 
If that weren't enough, the fleeing government staffs were chased by elements of the 41st Panzer Corps. The Yugoslavian forces, 23 infantry and 3 cavalry divisions, were never going to defeat tanks, planes, artilleries, and bombs. Their own tanks, no more than a hundred, were generations behind the panzers. After all, General Weiss, who was attacking from the north, from the lands of former Austria, commanded the German Second Army, which made for Zagreb in the northwest, the Italian Second Army, coming in from the west to clean up anyone who fled from Zagreb, as well as securing the coast, and the Third Hungarian Army, which captured territory just above Belgrade to the east. What few Yugoslavian units had been mobilized were sent to the north of the country, that being the logical point of attack, and were about to be destroyed, captured, or overrun by the Axis forces just mentioned. But the offenses from the north were as much an oversized feint as an attack. It was Field Marshal von List of the German 12th Army who would ring the death knell of Yugoslavian independence by attacking to the south from Bulgaria. His forces, outnumbering the local defenders, would make for Skopje and Niche in the southeast and then head south for Macedonia. Others under his command, namely the 18th and 30th Corps, would keep the Metexas line in eastern Greece, stationed above Salonika, honest, with a direct assault. Yet, it was to be the German 60th Panzer Corps, also of the 12th Army, that was to begin the attack that would see the end of Greek and British resistance. After taking Monastir and surrounding cities at the southern edge of Yugoslavia, the Germans would cross over the border, and the dread machines would find they had the good fortune of entering Greece in between the Greeks and Albania and the Commonwealth forces with other Greek units along the Alekmon line just above Mount Olympus. And in that gap was the beginning of the end of Greece. The hope had been Yugoslav forces would have linked up with the Allies. As for Yugoslavia, against such overwhelming odds, it would be Poland all over again. As for the Italians in Albania, the Ninth and Eleventh Armies, and in their hands lay Mussolini's pride and shriveling honor, would need almost three weeks to advance fifty miles in a line about parallel with Mount Olympus. But by then, the battle for Greece would be all but over. The ancient philosophers said that true happiness comes from within. Well, obviously, they never played Best Fiends. This free-to-download game has it all. Fun characters, new challenges, and thousands of puzzles to play. Whenever I have a few minutes, I bring it up, and I carry on with my quest to get to level 1000 before my wife does. The competition in our house is fierce, more fiendish, and bragging rights are everything. I'm currently on level 87, so I have a ways to go, but that's part of the fun. The gathering of cute characters is my fave by far. I love the artwork. And you can play Best Fiends without an internet connection once you download it. And know that every win brings new challenges and new in-game events are added all the time. So let enough is never enough be your mantra. Download Best Fiends for free from the App Store or Google Play. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Zagreb in the north was captured on April 10th, just four days into the war. Those forces then split. Some went south toward Sarajevo. Some went to help attack Belgrade, which fell two days later. What was left of it? But as speed was of the essence, and this was the brilliance of the German attack plan, Generalist's 12th Army invaded, as mentioned, from northwest Bulgaria, attacking underneath the pathetic defensive shield. Niche in eastern Yugoslavia was attacked by the 11th Corps and the 14th Panzer Corps, and it fell on April 8th. These forces then rushed north, along the Morova River to help occupy Belgrade, as well as capturing government officials fleeing 
the capital. Coming from western Bulgaria, Generalist 60th Panzer Corps went for Skopje, located in southern Yugoslavia, about halfway between the Bulgarian and Albanian borders. It fell on April 7th. Its rear thus safe. The 60th Panzer Corps then dashed south, straight for Monastir, just on the Yugoslav side of the border with Greece. And during this advance, the Strumnica Pass was taken over. This left the door to Salonika in central Greece wide open. And the Germans planned to build on their success. Meanwhile, units of the Italian 2nd Army, who had come in from the far west, moved down along the coast, meeting little organized resistance. It must be said that the Germans facing the Yugoslav forces before Skopje were held up for a few hours. This may not seem like much, but it delayed the overall attack plan. Yet those stolid forces paid for their courage by being overrun by panzers as they rushed in to break the defenders' spirits and bodies. Skopje, just to the north of Monastir, fell twelve hours into the second day of the attack. The attack on Yugoslavia was proceeding almost on schedule. In fact, as panic had spread throughout the Yugoslav defenses, there had been many who had surrendered without fighting. Or, in the cases of extreme right-wing Croats or Slovene nationalists, they either conspired with or started negotiating with the Germans at the onset of hostilities. What they didn't do was fight. To put the Battle of Yugoslavia into perspective, the Germans had suffered after many of the major cities were occupied, Sarajevo would hold out until April 16th, only 151 fatal casualties. But as bad as things were going for the Allies, for the two Balkan countries, it was even worse for C&C Wavell. On April 3rd, just days before the Germans moved into Greece and Yugoslavia, Former Iraqi Prime Minister Rashid Ali Gailani, who was pro-German and anti-British, took control of the government in Baghdad after the regent fled, having discovered Gailani's plan to assassinate him. Now back in power, Rashid Ali had an Iraqi artillery force sent to the RAF base at Habaniya. The British weren't about to leave, so the Iraqis began a siege. This was the last thing the Allies needed, as much-needed oil had been flowing from Iraq for the war effort, not to mention the country served as a land bridge between British-led troops in India and Egypt. Churchill immediately ordered Wavell to hold that base as it would serve as a starting point to retake Iraq. Wavell must have wondered what could possibly happen next. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So um, I just wanted to say hi to my new members and um, remind everyone that Christmas, oh my God, yes, is coming up. So just please remember me if you're having trouble thinking of what to get someone who's being rather difficult. I've got the CDs, I've got mugs, I've got hats, I've got T-shirts, probably something else I can't remember right now. But just check out my website, worldwar2podcast.net, and just, you know, just check it out. And maybe I can help you, you know, with your Christmas shopping. So as far as donations, I would like to thank Michael P. from Drummore, UK, Michael K. from Villanova, Pennsylvania, Darren S., and I think you made this up, Darren, just to hear me say it, Kumbaba in Queensland, Australia. But um, not trying to be insensitive, just uh, I think you just wanted to hear me say it. So uh, thank you very much, Darren. And don't worry about the amount. If everybody gave what you gave, um, I would be able to uh, do this full time. So again, I really do appreciate it. And I'd like to thank Linda W. from Madison, Wisconsin, who bought two mugs, one Churchill and one FDR. Um, I'm not sure what this means, but she's given her brother the FDR, and she's going to keep Churchill. So, good on you. Uh, and to my members, I would just like to say hi. Um, Adam W. from Brisbane, Australia. Um, Toby Green from Longview, Texas. 
and Jim F. from Sarasota, Florida. My son will, not in Sarasota, but my son will be there soon um, doing his year-long training with um, aviation um, repair or whatever it is he's going to be working on planes. I can't remember what they call it. So he'll be down in Florida. Hopefully I'll use that as an excuse to go see him and get a tan. And there's one more person, and I'm going to butcher the name, and I apologize. Um, Nets, Nets Barack Z from Derby in the UK. So I'm really sorry if I said it wrong. Chances are I did. I hope I didn't do too bad on the uh, Greek names this time uh, and the Yugoslav uh, names as well. But I promise to butcher more in the future. So um, I have the next one pretty much written up. I'll get it out as soon as I can and we'll um, go into Greece and to Crete and then get back to Rommel and just see how it, see where it goes. And again, I just want to thank everybody for listening, for being patient with me. And, um, Keep in mind that there are 20 episodes of the Caesar um, podcast that are out there, lifeofcaesar.com. Check it out. Cam and I try to have a lot of fun. And also, if you're thinking about membership, there are 41 episodes now um, as far as the different backstories uh, for World War II. So consider that. And again, you can find that on the website, worldwar2podcast.net. So take care, everyone. I will see you as soon as I can with the next episode, 113. Oh, sorry. Um, P.S. One more thing. Um, to my fellow nerd in history, James out there, who sent me a box, who made it quite clear he wasn't going to spend the money to send an equal box to Australia, I really need you to email me at net. I have lost your email, and I want to reciprocate with something to you. So, James, um, please send me an email as soon as you can. I feel very bad that I lost your email. Um, but get in touch with me. I'll get in touch with you. And I just want to thank you for the wonderful gift that you sent. Um, and I just want to pay you back in kind.